if we could do that. I might video off if that's cool, but otherwise I'm fine with vocals and stuff. Yeah, cool, lovely. Yeah. Um, and Rose, we've just seen you come in. Hey, sorry, I've just realised I've got my camera covered. I'll just, oh, okay. Let's see. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can see you now too. All right, cool. Lovely, awesome. Cool, how are you? <laughs> Good, thanks, how are you? Good. So Rose, we've just gone around the room and just introduced ourselves. So would you like to introduce yourself and let us know where, where you're from? I mean, I know you, but where you're from and how long yeah. you've been using OA for? So I'm from Melbourne, currently within my 5K zone. <laughs> um, I, I've been hairdressing for over 20 years and I've been using, I used Weller for 18 or so years and then swapped to Oway because it's more in line with how I live. Yep. But yeah, I still feel like a new newbie to Weller. So yeah. So this would be great <laughs> for you. <laughs> yeah, you've got a beautiful studio space up there. I love it. It's really cool. Yeah, I'm pretty lucky. <laughs> yeah, it's good. Yeah. Lovely. Okay then. So I'll just go run through a little bit of um, Zoom room etiquette before we start, if that's okay. Um, so first and foremost, I want this to be really relaxed, um, a relaxed environment, informal. Um, we, we're going to have a bit of a Q&A at the end. So if you've got some technical questions that you want to ask or we want to um, mishmash around the room, because obviously, you know, you guys and a lot of you have been using OA um, for a while and you might have some tricks and tips up your sleeves that you're happy to share um, with everybody as well. But if you do have any questions along the way regarding anything that I'm talking about, please um, feel free to step in. Pop your hand up or just turn your mic off if those who don't have their screens on and just ask away um, because it's, it's good to do that. And I tend to talk a lot. So um, if, if you need me to slow down or recap on something, just butt in, it's all good to do that. Um, but what I might get you to do though, is if we could just all turn our microphones, which I think we already have, just all to me, just in case there's any background noise, that would be great. Um, so, what we're going to cover today, so welcome to, to this Zoom session, which is all about grey coverage. Um, I did a little bit of research when I was um, doing this one, just statistically to find out, you know, percentages worldwide of grey hair, who's colouring their hair, um, are they doing it at home, are they coming into the salons, and it was pretty staggering, the results I found. Um, there was a result done in the UK that um, has revealed that 32% of women um, are going grey before the age of 30. Um, so that same study that was done 20 years ago, it was only 18%. So there's a 14% increase in women. Um, I mean, they left, left guys out of this, so I'm sorry, but women going grey. What that's telling us is there's, um, obviously you have a lot of scientists that would say going grey is a genetic, it's part of your DNA other external factors. And we know as hairdressers that there's external factors through stress or trauma, because we're dealing with clients and we've seen clients um, that have had a lot of stress in their lives or illness. And then they've come in and over a six month period, um, they're a lot grayer than what they were initially. So I believe that there's external um, uh, concerns or, or things happening to make us go grayer earlier. But at the same token, it is a lot of DNA and what's programmed in our body to do that. But I thought it was really interesting, the fact that there is so many uh, companies now that are, you know, targeting grey hair clients when you watch the television and, you know, it's um, L'Oreal Excellence and all these grey coverage, you notice they're increasing the advertisement and using the words for grey coverage for a reason because clients are progressively getting greyer. And their expectations for coverage can be different, but as a salon, obviously, we've got to be able to, to give them, you know, what they want when it's... Um, in relation to their great coverage and do it successfully for a couple of reasons. Um, I believe our own credibility, you know, if someone comes in and wants um, total great coverage, we've got to be able to give them that and not make excuses of why it didn't happen or, you know, passing the blame onto somebody else or it was, you know, there's lots of uh, reasons. But at the same time as we are the professionals and we're supposed to be able to get it right. Um, and we want to, to, to be credible in our industry as well and have that client come back to us. 
Um, so I thought if we went over topics today, like, um, you know, a proper consultation um, uh, regarding grey hair coverage, um, do they want total block coverage or are they after something that's more gradual or more blending or more camouflage result? So it's really important that we, we understand and know that before we start our execution of colour. Uh, another thing I think we should go over is the texture difference between greys and what this means um, when we're analysing grey hair. Um, the correct amount of base versus overtone. Um, every company is different. There is all sorts of different rules with grey coverage. Um, some companies have specific lines that just cover grey hair um, that aren't intermixable with the rest of their lines. We don't have that. Um, we'll go over that a little bit in a minute, but it's really important that we um, understand how much base we need to put in versus how much tone or our target colour so we can actually saturate that hair properly. Um, our mixing ratios. So this is now getting more OA technical. Um, our mixing ratios, um, product versus developer and how we um, and why we do that. Um, our application and timing. And then we'll go over some troubleshooting um, or I'll have a general Q&A at the end. Um, does anyone have any questions before we start or that's all pretty self-explanatory? Yep, cool. Um, so our consultation. I believe consultation is paramount no matter what you're doing, whether it's a haircut, whether it's a fashion colour, whether it's grey coverage, but particularly when you um, are breaking down a client's um, hair type and analysing what you need to do for grey coverage. Um, we have diagnostic forms, which I spoke about yesterday in our, because um, yesterday's chat was more about colour correction because of post-colour disasters. I would still use um, the format of using a colour analysis form in my mind as opposed to physically pull it out, but breaking down everything that you need to know to get your end result correctly. Um, the first thing I would do when I spoke to a client or look at a client is see what was done before. So if they're a new client to your salon, you would obviously see how much regrowth they've got and look at the previous colour based on how much that covered or it didn't cover. Um, I'm just letting Sheree into the room. Um, and then that's going to give you a clear indication of what that client got previously um, and what their expectations may be. So does that client want block coverage is the first thing I would ask them. Um, are they looking for a total solid cover of grey hair or are they happy to have it blended or camouflage it? Um, the reason for this and one of the reasons this is important um, is because it's very easy to change our mix to get a camouflage or a, a translucent block coverage. Um, just as easy as is, it is if you misdiagnose somebody that has super resistant hair and they want a full block coverage, it can happen that easy. You'll get one result rather than the other. Um, and I also think too, and what I'm seeing through social media, at a certain stage of a woman's life, and they sick, you know, some clients, they just get to the point where they, they're tired of coming in and having all this grey hair coverage. They might want to grow their hair colour out. So there's ways that we need to mix our products to be able to do that as well. Has anyone seen a bit of a shift, especially because of lockdown? Maybe people are growing their hair out um, or embracing a little bit more of the greys and we are changing our techniques and how we do it. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree with that too. Um, it's really important that we know um, also to obviously your mixing ratio and the developer use when preparing a colour. Um, we will do, um, you know, for a full block coverage of grey hair, we, we will always recommend you use 20 volume with a mixing ratio of one to one. Okay. So with a grey blending, um, you can use H-tone for grey blending. Um, our H-tone obviously is a nine vol, which typically works traditionally just like a 10 vol would. I don't know why I did a nine vol. Um, I get exactly the same results, but um, then as with, with a 10 vol. Um, with a mixing ratio of one to one and a half or one to one for a strong resistant hair, um, 10 vol will give you more of a camouflage result. On clients that have super fine hair, I find mixing one-to-one -one with H-tone, you actually can get pretty good saturation with that and, and great coverage. So it's case specific um, with like most brands or most clients that you just need to work that out. But it's important to know that going in for great coverage, 20 vol is your, you know, your hero developer and your mixing ratio is predominantly equal parts. And we'll go over why we do that in a sec too. 
Um, so then we've got the texture of the gray hair. So we have, um, you know, gray hair versus resistant gray hair. I always think that is really important to understand what types of gray hair that we're actually working with on our heads. Um, and we all notice that there's different textures in gray hair just by looking at it. Like you can see a client um, with some gray hairs that are, you know, really, really coarse um, and others are quite fine. Others are kind of wiggly and wiry and stick out. So obviously, um, from what I found that grey hair generally is um, a coarser type of um, hair because it doesn't contain any pigment. Um, so grey hair obviously has um, a process or hair has a process. Obviously, we all know this as it grows and melanin gets um, produced and put into the hair as it grows out. So when that stops happening, that's obviously why we don't get any colour and we thus have white hair or grey hair. So it's generally coarser. And one of the things we hear is when we are colouring our client's hair, that the client will say, oh, my hair feels lovely and soft now. That's because we've injected pigment into the hair. So we're softening the hair down due to the lack of it being in there. Hence, the structure of that hair has changed. So colouring hair or colouring grey hair makes it feel softer um, and um, doesn't change the complete structure of the hair, but it does you know, soften it down like a really heavy moisturiser would do for your skin. Um, but when you're breaking down the different textures of, of um, gray hair, you can see them, like I said before, they're either fine and glassy, um, thick and coarse, and some are wiry, um, and are quite typically curly compared to their normal hair, which generally could be quite straight. And, and then you actually have these like bits that just stick out, like really wiry bits. These are all key signs of letting you guys know of how we're gonna approach this color. Okay, and how we're going to get total coverage with it. Um, I break them down into three categories. Um, I call them the easies, the maybes, and the hardies. I mean, it's so totally not technical, um, but it makes sense, okay? Um, so the easies for me, they're generally finer in texture. Um, they, they don't necessarily have a real glossy, glassy look about them. Um, being finer, they tend to be long to fine hair clients more regularly um, than not. Um, and being the fact that they're not thick and coarse, they have a, the better way to put it, a higher saturation point because they're not as big and, and strong. So they'll actually accept that colour. So I find this head of hair the easiest type to cover. This is when you'll probably find it quite successful to when you're adding your basing for coverage, you might still be able to mix your ratio at one to one and a half. If your amount of gray that's in there is obviously less than about 20%. Um, the maybes or the in-between, um, that to me, um, this is when you look at a gray hair and you're not sure. You think, okay, I don't think it's super coarse and resistant. However, there's a few that are sticking out. The majority of them aren't. Um, some look a little bit glassy and resistant, others don't. Um, in this case, I would always go for a recommendation of always mixing your, your mixing ratio one to one, okay? Um, and sometimes you might wanna implement some techniques um, and tricks into your color mixing ratio for the, the harder or the hardies to cover, um, which I'll go over that now. They, the hard ones to me are the ones that they really stand out next to the natural hair. They could be that you have 100% grey hair on that client, but they're really obvious. You know, they really stick out, um, they're wiry, they're coarse and unruly, or they're just super shiny and super glassy. When hair is super glassy like that, it's showing you that the cuticle compact is really, really tight, okay? It's so close. We, um, as a brand, do not use ammonia, as you all know. We use a product called MEA. So MEA has a completely different pH level than ammonia. They are relatively cousins when you break it all down in the fact that they will achieve a very similar result. However, ammonia has a higher pH level than MEA. So when you lift your pH over 10 in a hair structure, um, it's pretty much when you're causing the most damage. Okay, which is irreversible. When you are only lifting up to a 10, like between a nine and a 10, like MEA does, you're pretty uh, careful that you're, you know, you're retaining the integrity of the hair. Um, but obviously you're not really opening that cuticle enough 
for, for penetration, which is why we do certain tricks to our mixes to actually help us saturate um, our dye load to that. So it's really important to know that when you are dealing with your gray hairs, that you assess what type of gray hair you've got. So you can go in with that, with that plan um, and that color mix. Um, so we have our mixing ratios of base versus overtone. Does all that make sense to you though, before I keep going? Yep. Um, and a lot of us would do this um, as well anyway. Um, so our mixing base versus overtone. Um, the other thing is, I mean, it's really important that we know this um, so we can obviously get our, our coverage and our target color um, can come through without any translucency. Um, we're all aware that OA is a warm based color, not a cool based color. So in the event that you were doing a straight base color or a, a 0, .0 um, we can achieve a really nice result without it being drab and flat. For example, if you've got uh, a client that's got 100% really coarse resistant hair and you're doing a 5.0 and your mixing ratio is one to one, your 5.0 is not going to be a flat drab awful color. It's actually going to be quite pretty. It's a really nice chocolate color. Um, so don't be concerned that if you have to go in and just use straight base that you're going to get a flat color. Whereas say other color companies that are cool based, um, that can almost work against you with coverage and you do need to add a little bit of gold in that to actually get that coverage as well. So I've, I've used both cool and warm and I prefer warm um, because I can always cool it down. Okay. But it seems weird that using a straight base in a cool, in a cool color range that you're not going to get as much coverage. I prefer it the other way around. So you will get a nice um, result on that. Um, it's also um, important to know that because we are a warm based color that if you want a cool result, you need to add ash, okay, in that. So you need to put at least a quarter um, of ash in your mix to cool that color down. Um, or you can use your 0.1s. So your 0.1s obviously are a natural ash. Um, your primary pigment after your point is a 60% um, makeup. So it'd be 60% base because it's an O. And then your one after that, or as your secondary tone, is going to sit at a 40%. So you've got 60% base and 40% ash already in that. So if you're working on a client that's 25% or less gray, you can go in straight with a 601 and quite successfully get coverage when you've done that mixing ratio of one to one. Okay, so that's a really good thing to, to know that sometimes we're using base so we know it's warm, we've got to add a bit of ash. Just remember if you've got that lower percentage of grey, your O1s do actually give really good grey coverage as well. I use them quite a bit. Um, does all that make sense? Has anyone got any questions on that or anything? No? Cool. Um, so your mixing ratios. So I've done uh, some cheat sheets up um, when I started working here because I've reread them all and um, I'm a bit of a firm believer after using a few different other brands that you some brands will give you full like full coverage um, on hair that has a lower percent um, of gray and we will too um, but when you're working in a on, on a you know a salon floor and you don't have time to be doing recoloring and you don't want to have to rebook that client and apologize for you know not getting as, as much coverage, I've kind of rejigged them and I've done them on a cheat sheet form, which is available for us to send out um, to you. Um, all new salons coming on board will get it automatically anyway, because I think it's really important that you you go over them. But we can flick it out to you um, from our OneDrive and you can print it out and have it laminated. So it's a really good tool to have in the salon when you have new staff members start or you're doing some in-salon training. Um, you don't need to, to do up a graph. I've already done it for you. So we'll go through the percentages of grey, um, how much base I would put in, um, my mixing ratios um, as well. So... I've started off with um, zero to 25% of gray. So when you're looking um, at a client's head of hair, obviously you're breaking it down into, um, you know, per square inch on the scalp, looking at that square inch going, how many grays versus naturals do I see in that? Do I see three or four strands? So it's, you know, it's around, you know, 5% or do I see a lot more? If you're looking at a client, obviously, and they're predominantly gray around the hairline and it's scattered through the back, um, 
you know, worst case scenario, you, you might need to do two mixes, especially if you're lifting through the back, if they're like a five and a, in a, you know, a seven here and you're depositing in the front, lifting in the back. But generally I would always do my mixing gray ratios for the majority of gray hair I've got in a concentrated area. So if they're, you know, 80% gray around the front, that's what I'll go in with. Um, so to alleviate you having to do two mixes. Um, so zero to 25%, I would do a quarter base to three quarters of my desired color. Now going back to looking at the client that has the easies or the, or the finer head of gray hair, um, if they were um, a bit lower percentage on that 25 and I thought, you know what, I'm gonna get pretty good coverage because they're fine, they don't look glassy. I've got a higher saturation point because the diameter of the hair is finer. Um, I would mix one to one and a half. Um, if there was a little bit of um, concern in there, whereas I thought that I mightn't get that coverage, just drop your ratio to one to one. So I've written on these cheat sheets that in the case of a small amount of resistant hair, you want to do your mix one to one. Okay. Um, with um, the next level, which is um, 25 to 50% gray hair versus natural, I would do half base then I would do half my desired color. Um, mixing one to one, and that as well. The next uh, level is 50 to 75% of gray hair. Um, this is where I mix, the, the, I do two thirds base to one third desired color. So on a 30 gram mix of color, you would obviously do 20 grams of your 6.0 and 10 grams of your 634 or, or whatever you were covering. Um, and then on my last one, which is 75% to 100% gray, I would do three quarters base to one quarter of my color desired result. One question I get asked a lot is, you're putting so much base in your color, is this gonna stop my color from, especially a fashion color, from being vibrant or, you know, I wanna do 866 and you're telling me to put, you know, three quarters of 7.0 in it on the regrowth area. Remembering our bases are warm. So they're not actually going to counteract and flatten that color down too much. So when you are working with a cool base color, generally, technically they'll tell you to use your 0.3 as opposed to your 0.0 or your gold instead of your natural. Whereas with ours, because our bases do have a warm undertone, um, you've, it, it won't dull that red down. You'll still get that vibrancy. But if you don't put enough base in it, then instead of getting a beautiful 8.66, you're gonna get some lolly translucent, bright kind of pinkish look, and then you'll get your, you know, your target color on the end. So it's really important that you do add enough base into your color as well. So like we touched on the, um, you know, the easy ones, um, the maybes, um, knowing that we've uh, looking at our hair texture as well, which is a key indication of, of what sort of technique we're gonna use or mixing ratio. If you're unsure, um, you can adopt some um, techniques from the harder heads of hair to color, which we're gonna go over now. Um, but always make sure that you follow these guidelines, especially when you're learning. It's okay to break rules and to stretch it when you know your client's hair. I'm a massive rule breaker and trying to make things work and pushing it. Um, obviously I do a lot of tests and I do um, colors on models so I can get away with it. Some of my models have four colors on either side of their head done with different mixes to make sure, you know, this will work, that won't work. Um, if you don't break rules, you can't learn as well. But I find that if you know your rules first and your ground rules and you get that confidence and the stability in what you're doing, then yeah, it's okay to, to bend the rules and make them work. And it all comes with experience, um, not even experience with how many years you've been hairdressing, but experience with how long you've used a product for because they're all different. So it's just, you know, getting your head around it and working with it. I also believe that it takes a good six months of working with a color before you've pretty much done every sort of color on every sort of head of different hair through that salon door, depending on how busy you are or what you've seen. So you might think, well, I've never tried it. If you're unsure, stick to your guidelines, make it work. And that way you can, you know, break some rules later and stretch out. Um, when you have a client that has, you know, really super coarse hair, which I then categorize it as the hardies, that the really hard ones to cover, um, I always anticipate a level of translucent coverage, no matter what. 
So translucent coverage is um, if you've got a client come to your salon and they've and you've looked at their hair. I had a, a mate who I don't color her hair. She has a, a weave put in, and I don't know how to do weave. So I, I so I'm not doing your hair. You can um, go to the salon you're going to, but um, they don't use OA and they use a color with ammonia in it. And she still had translucency um, with uh, her color. So um, it's obviously they're either misdiagnosing what's going on in their hair or they haven't anticipated the fact that um, my friend has medium to fine hair, but her gray hair is really glassy. Okay. So what that's telling you is even though it's, um, she's only got 30% gray hair, it's super glassy. She's going to be a hardy, not an easy. Okay. So you need to then think, okay, well, what do I do with that? Um, translucency obviously is a lighter version of the color that you've put on. It doesn't necessarily grab on all the grays, but it might grab on a percentage of them. Okay, so that percentage of translucency that you see on a client, so this is one way of diagnosing it. Um, whether you've done the color yourself and the clients come back in and gone, you know what, um, I love the color, um, but it was a little bit wishy-washy or I, I felt like I went gray quicker. That's what we hear, like oh, I went gray in two weeks. And it's the fact that we can see a regrowth line, but they see a demarcation line or a translucency patch where the gray, the hair color basically looks like it's washed off. That's called translucent coverage. That can always, in my mind, sit between about 30 to 70%. So if I'm looking at a head of hair that I have colored, I will then look at the patch and go, right, what level of translucency do I have in that, in that mix? Did 50% of the gray hairs cover and 50% didn't? Therefore, it's 50% translucent. What that tells me is when I go back to my mixing guide, I then need to think, okay, if I'm doing half 6.0 and half 6.34, I then need to look at my 6.0 and go, right, I need more strength from you. What can I do to make you give me my coverage and not give me my translucency? When I looked at the hair and it was 50% translucent, I then think, all right, well, I need to change 50% of my 6.0 to one shade darker, which is your 5.0. Okay, it won't go as dark as a five because what that five is going to do is basically sit on that 50% of translucency and give you a six level because translucent hair always appears lighter. So if you had a client as another case study that was 100% um, gray, she had really, really coarse resistant hair um, and you did an 8.0. Um, and it was like, yeah, I love it. It looked really great. When she comes back in, she mightn't tell, but you might see a little bit of translucency in that coverage. Um, you can go, right, well, it, was, it looks to me it's about 20% translucent. Then what you would do then, you would take um, your mix of, say, 40 grams of 7.0, and you would take 20% of that and put in 7.0, okay? She's still going to end up on an eight result. You're just going to limit the amount of translucency you're going to get, Okay. Worst case scenario, right? And this is what we do. And I'll explain why we're doing all these tricks because of what we have and don't have in the range. Worst case scenario, you can take that 6.0, which you would, that you've used and dropped half of that to a five and actually completely drop that to a five as well. So your mix would then be half 5.0, half 6.34. That's if you have a higher amount of translucency as your result. And I'm talking like 70, 80% of translucency. Um, you need that, that deeper base in there. What you're creating by doing that is basically a double end series, okay? It's not a negativity towards a brand that you have to do that. It's simply our technique to get around translucent gray coverage, just like um, another brand has a base series and then they have a double end series, okay? So if you, had, if you looked at your client and you thought, oh, that's like super gray, really resistant, instead of using 6N, I'm going to use 6 double N. Okay. In a lot of those cases, you can't intermix your double end series in with your fashion shades. They don't allow you to do that. Some of them make other fashion shades that you can intermix with them, but it's rare. So we have a hybrid system. All our colors are anything you want them to be. They're toners, they're high lifts, they're gray coverage, they're boosters, they're, they're everything, depending on what you mix it with regarding your developer. So what you're indirectly doing is you're saving money by not having to buy a whole double end series. You just use the one product you've got and you make a double end by adding a deeper base in it. Because when you look at a color chart from a range that has a double end series, they're all half a shade darker than the existing base anyway. So that means that they've got a darker base in them to give you coverage. 
and those colors have ammonia in them and we don't. So um, a lot of companies um, have different tricks and techniques to get great coverage, but each great coverage client is completely unique and it's never going to be the same. And there's always, you know, one or two tricky clients that we have and we think, oh, what am I going to do to get this? But this is why I've done this. So we've just got these simple procedures to follow. It might mean that you have to try four of them to get it. Um, but this is where I want you to use your gut instincts and go, right, I'm anticipating translucency from this really thick, heavy, coarse hair or this really fine, shiny, glassy hair. I will drop my base, a percentage. Even if you drop it half to start with, you might get a little bit, but then you know the client won't notice, but you'll know next time to put more in it when she comes back in. Okay. Um, mixing ratio. Does all that make sense to you? So that's how we make a double N. Yep. Um, mixing ratios for the color and develop up. So we've briefly touched on that. Um, mixing ratio normally in our color is one to one and a half or one to two when you're doing a super blonde or using H bleach. To make um, a super gray coverage, we always mix it one to one. So what we're doing is we're still putting enough oxygen in the product to um, develop the pigment, but we're actually increasing the amount of MEA versus oxygen, which is our swelling of the hair agent and also increasing our dye load. So we're actually helping to penetrate that. So in most cases, in your general in-betweenies and your finers, you will get, or your easy, sorry, you will get really good coverage mixing one-to-one -one, as long as you put enough base in, the, in your hair, in your, in your colour mix versus your overtone, um, and that you do um, uh, mix that ratio one-to-one -to, -one to make sure that you're saturating that pigment. So, for example, you're putting 40 grams of colour, you put 40 grams of 20 ml. Um, I always think that, um, and that's going back to help making a, a double end series as well by doing that. Um, when you're, your next step for, for beautiful great coverage is your application and your timing. So super important. We all know that our application when we're doing grey hair, especially using a product um, like ours that doesn't have that ammonia, that instant boom swelling action that ammonia creates. We have a very slow release oxidating colour that our application is really important. Um, it's great to take finer sections um, and making sure that when you're putting the colour on that you're putting enough on. So um, we... Re Describe it um, when we're teaching that, you know, you would put it on like you're spreading peanut butter on a piece of toast, not Vegemite, okay? So you've got to put enough on. Um, you, still, you still want oxygen in there to develop it, like the aeration, so don't like put loads on, but your finer sections will help you with your application. I always find that if I'm taking a section and I'm lifting it up, I want to see a little bit of that product push back, a little bit of that tint push through in my section when I lift up, then I know I've got enough on the other side and then I will re, um, reapply the top and then reapply the bottom. Take my section, lift it up, watch it push through, then apply it that way. Um, and obviously we all know that we start at the greyest areas. So there's no point starting a grey regrowth at the back. You always start where the hair's greyer and that's generally going to be around the front. Um, and if they've got that side area here that's really tough and wiry, I always dab it all around the hairline first and then I'll start my cross section just so it's been it's had a little bit longer on that hairline um, you set your timer after you finish the application these are pretty basic things but we've got to go over them so you set your timer after so we do a minimum of 45 minutes processing time um, and that's going to start yeah as soon as you finish the last part of your application it's really important um, that we process our grey coverages for 45 minutes and not 35 minutes um, as per 20 vol instructions. Um, that last five minutes is crucial for timing. Um, I know when I've spoken to a few of you um, that you've increased the timing a little bit as well. Um, the longer the colour's been on, the better result you will get. Um, we, depending on how a salon booking system is set up, not everybody has, you know, 50 minutes to an hour to process our colours either. So sometimes, you know, we might want to stretch out our application time or, you know, just to 45 minutes rather than half an hour when you're doing a grey coverage, get it on in your half an hour. That way you've, you know, you've got that little bit more development time while your next client's coming. But 45 minutes is crucial that we leave it on. The biggest um, thing that I'm hearing is um, not so much application, but it's timing or mixing ratios. I think we can overlook it or we can forget. 
Um, you might fluke it and actually get a really nice color result one time with a client um, by mixing one to one because one to one and a half because she had that finer uh, head of gray hair. But then the next client will come in and you've, you're not thinking and you're doing it. And then all of a sudden you've got translucency and it's like, why hasn't this worked? You know, so it's really important to, to do that. Do your ratios and your application um, perfect. Um, I still believe um, there's clients out there that have really tough, resistant gray hair. We've all got them. Um, so we've got a few other things that are added into our range um, that can help us get that coverage. Um, so this is more like your troubleshooting area. So we have a product um, called Hypercolor. Um, traditionally, Hypercolor is used as a process accelerator. Um, it works when you apply heat to it, when you add it into your product um, and mix it in and add your developer. Um, and you can cut, say, a 30 minute processing time down to 10, um, let it cool for five and then rinse. Um, it works, but you, you, need, you need the addition of heat. Um, how Hypercolor works, is everyone familiar with Hypercolor or used it before? No? Uh, yes and no? Cool. How Hypercolor works is it's really important that you add it to your product first and then you mix it in. So there's other companies that make, um, and they're not even uh, color companies that make hair color, but they make this additive that has essential oils in it to do the same sort of thing. Um, and Hypercolor, we already have it. It's part of our H system. So it is essential oils. Uh, you get two benefits from it. You'll get a, a, a really long, like a longer result processing time by using it, but also heaps and heaps of shine. Because it's an oil-based product, it adds incredible shine to the hair as well. So sometimes I use it when a client's got some damaged hair or it's a little bit dry and we're just doing a regular color and I wanna boost the condition and shine up in that client's hair. I'll use a bit of hyper color as well. Not necessarily to reduce my processing time, but make my work look better. <laughs> That's how I do it. Um, so, how hypercolor works? <clears throat> Sorry, Sorry, you go. I have a question. Go for um, it. So, if you were going to use it to, as like to improve, I guess a gloss or a shine. Yep. Do you would you still use heat or? You don't need to. You just it just won't reduce your processing time. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. So you can do it. Yeah. Great question. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, could you add it in like without using heat? For example, if you were foiling like kind of like an Olaplex type of situation. Yeah, you can do that. Yeah, yeah, you can also add it. Like we're, we're gonna, uh, like I've got a session on um, toning as well. And I use it in my toners for that very same reason too. I actually use it a lot. I think there's a lot of products in the H system because we, as a company, there's not a lot of brands that actually make a full on H system. They might have a post color shampoo. That's pretty much it. Whereas we have a whole range. And I think sometimes we get a little bit uh, daunted or we haven't done enough research on them or you haven't been educated enough is probably the main thing of how to use them. Um, so H system is a really good system to use um, and you'll use it in all different ways. And like I said, you know, knowing how it works, break the rules and use it for other things and you'll get really good results. I put H color in my moisture masks at the basin with a hot towel over them when I'm doing a treatment because it's on for five minutes with a hot towel. Abby's nodding because she does that. And it gives a result like it's been on for 20 minutes. So if you're pushed for time and you know that a 20 minute processing time of moisture mask is gonna be way better or a rebuilding mask than a quick three minute lovely massage at the basin, massage it for three, hot towel it with the hypercolor in it, leave it on for an extra you know, two or three minutes, boom, you get like a so much better result because that hypercolor um, will draw it into the hair. So how it works is um, you mix it in with your color first. You always mix it, together with your color and then you add your developer. So in your Opedia, there's instructions on how to use um, Hypercolor. I read them and I read them about five times and I was totally confused every time I read it. I'm like, I don't get it. So they give you total mixes, but then because our mixing ratio is one to one and a half, none of the total mixes made sense to me. So I did all my maths, divided it all down. And basically for every 10 grams of color you put in the bowl, you put four drops of Hypercolor, okay? And it's a much simpler way of learning how to use it. Um, so if you've done um, 20 grams of colour, you put in eight drops. Obviously, so that, that ratio will go up depending how much colour. This is prior to adding your developer, okay? You then mix it together really well in the bowl. And then you would add your uh, 
the right amount of 20 vol. So say if it's um, 40 grams, you would do 40 grams and, you, and you'd put of color, you'd put your 16 drops of hypercolor, mix it together. And then you would put your 40 grams of 20 vol in that bowl as well. And then you mix it all together that way. And what's happening is all the oils in the hypercolor are attracted to the color molecule in our, in our color or in our tint and they encompass, they circle it. And then when you mix it with hydrogen peroxide and it hits the hair, it works on positive, positive and negative charges and it pushes it away and it pushes it further and deeper into the hair. That's how it increases your process, it decreases your processing time because it works faster. Now with gray hair coverage, when you're using hypercolor, we don't want you to reduce the 45 minute processing time, okay? With or without heat, irrespective, still leave it on for 45 minutes because our main target is we want gray coverage, yeah? But what the hypercolor is doing, even without added heat on for 45 minutes is giving us a processing time of about an hour to an hour and 10 minutes. So if we were didn't use hypercolor and we left our regular tint on, mixed as a resistant mix and left it on for longer, we know we're going to get better coverage, but we don't always have the opportunity to leave a tint on for that long. So minimum 45 minutes, add your hypercolor in, leave it on for 45 to 50 if you can, and you will get like over an hour's processing time. So a lot of salons, including myself, have found hypercolor works beautifully that way. It's not taught that way, but it works the same way too. Okay, that's really good. Um, you just have to remember that your applicate, well, how you mix hypercolor, if you mix it with your developer and your tint the other way around, you're not going to get as benefit from it because all that hydrogen peroxide, all the developer dilutes it all down and it stops the H um, hypercolor, sorry, from attracting itself to that color molecule enough. Does that make sense? Yep, cool. Is there any other questions on that one before? No? Yep, Abby? So it might sound like a stupid question, but when you're mixing your hypercolor into your color pigment, so your, your tint, yep. um, so you put your tint in, then you put your hypercolor in, you mix that together, and then you can then add your hydrogen peroxide straight yep. in. That's There's no downtime. Like as, as soon as you've stirred it together, essentially, yep. it's starting to. Yeah, it's done its job. Yeah, you've mixed it through. Yeah, so not just a little, there you go. It needs to be a proper, you know, probably a 10 second mix. Then you add your developer, mix it all together, and then it works better that way. Yeah, cool. Good question. Um, we have other salons that do use heat for great coverage. Okay. If you're going to use heat for great coverage, um, bear in mind whenever you add heat, you can throw five to 10% more warmth on a color. So if you're after a cool gray coverage color, adding heat might decrease the amount of um, work that your ash is going to do in that. Just bear that in mind. Um, the salons that do use heat, I've, you know, picked their brain a lot going, cause I don't use heat, um, at all. Um, they will have it on for the full 45 minutes, but on an extremely low setting. Okay. And I think what they're doing is, uh, and this makes sense that if, especially here, the further North you go, we have air con in the salon all the time. And some salons are like freezing cold. Like I've walked into my, oh my God, it's so cold. Like I'm, it's ridiculous um the weather can affect your processing time on page bleach um how a color develops all that sort of stuff so if you've got um uh, a climazon or a roller bowl just on really low heat what you're doing is you're controlling that area around the client's head and giving them more of a uniform um, processing time so if you do have a heat accelerator or a roller ball um, you can use it um, just make sure it's on low Okay, and being on low is also going to stop that color if you're after a cool result from throwing too much warmth as well. But I have heard that works really well too. Um, so I don't use heat in my salon either. I don't have anything. I just yep. don't. Um, what about something like wrapping? Will that create enough heat? Yeah. So yep. if you, yeah, even with H bleach with foils as well. So if you've got um, like, there's a couple of ways. You know, we we tend to not use a lot of plastic in the salon because it just goes against everything that we you know we stand for. But mm, you know, yeah. there is cling wrap in the drawer sometimes because sometimes you do need to use it. I'm not going to wrap um, a full head bleach in a towel um, mm. because it's, it's too heavy. Okay, and yeah. you're going to create too much weight and you're going to push blonde bits on the regrowth. But I would definitely use um, cling film to do that. Um, or you could, even more so than a, than a recyclable shower cap, I just think you want to put as less pressure 
on the top as you can. And with cling fill, you can softly, loosely do it. Yeah. So I find if, if, you, if you're going to do that, um, we'll let you do that. Um, but um, definitely by enclosing it and encapsulating and letting the heat that's created by your own scalp, do that bit of processing, 100%. Especially if you're in a room and you've got an air conditioner on that wall and this side you're sitting near a window with the sun coming in. Like yes. you're asking for a disaster there. You've really got to make sure that you, you, your cell and environment temperature is controlled evenly. Um, but that's not always the case because you could have some stylists that, you know, work hot and want it cold and others are like, oh my God, you know, I need to set over here and, you know, you're going to get different variations. So yeah, by wrapping it, 100%, 100% you do that. Yeah. Okay, cool. I think it's going to be um, a, a worst case scenario that you have to do that, to be honest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just I, for someone that, if they were super resistant and I sort of felt like I should use heat if I could do get, that. I guess, a similar result just from wrapping it um, yeah. instead of using a rollerball or something. Yeah, I think, yeah, great. Um, and then we do have one last um, thing we can do. And I, you know, it works really well. I always use this one as my last resort purely because um, I wouldn't say that I'm lazy, but um, I think sometimes, you know, if you can get to your go-tos a lot quicker, um, I, I do that first. But um, we have H-Tech Shampoo. So H-Tech Shampoo has a pH so all the, all the back basin uh, uh, H system range is all pH balanced for a reason, okay? It's all designed to be set up for you to maximise your results and, and, and achieve the best condition on, on the hair. So our H-Tech shampoo, he, he has a pH of 9.5 to 10.5. Now, you remember we talked about the levels of, um, well, the pH levels of ammonia versus MEA. So ammonia is up to 11 and your MEA is up to 10. So our... Uh, H Tech shampoo is 9.5 to 10.5. So it's really high. So when you're doing a shampoo with H Tech, and I'm sure we all have, you'll notice that if you ruffle the hair up, you can create an awful mess in there. Okay. So how we use H Tech shampoo, that is for that client that is just like the one that you would have to pre soften. Okay. The worst case scenario when you're putting like raw tin or something that you have to do to pre soften, which happened years ago, we're trying not to do that anymore. Um, so you would give the, take the client, get them to come in 10 minutes earlier for their appointment, um, have them washed at the back basin or wash them yourself at the back wash with H-Tech shampoo. It's really important that you don't over ruffle the scalp. We always like to have a little bit of oils naturally on the scalp before we do a color um, because of sensitivity, even though our products are so low um, in, in irritants. Um, you still have hypersensitive clients, okay? Um, so I that's where H-Screen can benefit you as well. Um, but with um, our H-Tech shampoo, just try not to over overstimulate the scalp a lot. Just massage it into the kind of like grey hairs and just let it sit for a minute, okay? Don't do this for the whole couple of minutes. Just let it sit for a minute or two. Rinse it out. The hair's not going to feel amazing. It's going to feel quite raspy and a little raw. Um then you need to towel dry, rough dry it off with um, a blow dryer um, and then apply your colour um, straight over the top of that because what you've done is you've actually broken or opened that grey hair's cuticle a little bit so then the MEA can go in and actually do a better job. So h -Tank shampoo works really well. That's something that OA will um, educate as a go-to. Uh, I find if you do all the others and they don't work as well, um, then you go to your H Tech shampoo purely from from a timing point of view. Or if you've got some assistance and you you know you want to do that, you can get the client to come in earlier and, and be washed and dried, ready to go. But that works really, really, really good as well. So I hope I haven't missed anything going over it all. But that's pretty much um, our way um, of really securing grey hair coverage. It's just um, recapping, you know, it's really important to, to analyse how the percentage of grey hair you're working with. That's going to tell you what base, how much base to put in. The type of grey hair is going to determine whether you're going to get translucency or not. So do I need to drop that level down um, half a shade? Do I need to drop it a full shade? Um, obviously, your mixing ratios are really, really important. If in doubt, always go one to one, okay, just to maximise that coverage or put more of that dye load into it and your processing times. And then obviously we've covered little hints and tips to, to help you do that. Um, does anyone have any questions or wanted to throw a case study at me or you're having some difficulty or it's been something that you haven't mastered and want to go over while we're all in the room? 
Um, I have a question. So is this regard does this all information all regard to H nectar as well? Or is that completely different? No, so H nectar is a different colour. Mm -hmm. So H nectar obviously is our uh, softer, um, more it's a plumping treatment colour. Um, yeah. would always run and how I educate H nectar, it's going to be a subline in your salon. Okay. It's not going to be your go-to unless you've got that client that's coming that says I'm allergic to everything. Yeah. Um, my hair is fine and fragile and broken. Um, it's a really beautiful, amazing color line for restoring, replumping. Um, I believe you get a softer result. However, I've done great coverage with it on a client in a salon, uh, a non oa salon. <laughs> Um, that now use H nectar because she was hyper allergic to everything. Um, mm -hmm. And I, in my mix, I only did half base and half of the six, three, four, and half of that base was half 7.0 and half 6.0 because they wanted to go lighter. Um, mm -hmm. And I got like full coverage, absolute okay. full coverage with it. It was amazing. Is this one to one ratio? Yeah, one to one. H nectar is always mixed one to one. Okay. Yeah. yeah as opposed to so that, that mixing ratio will never change with that. And obviously it's a smaller range and doesn't have the amount of, of fashion tones in it, yeah. um, but it is beautiful. It's not to be confused with say um, shades of Q gel. Okay. It's a gel color, but it's not a semi-permanent. It's a- I've only ever used a Veda and now, or OCS and now OA. So I'm, I'm pretty, um, I guess, used to making my own color, if that makes sense. We just have like a base and then you're- you um, Yeah your tone so I guess in a way I'm kind of used to that but I've I've only really used H nectar for like toning and and yeah. like uh, you know um ends color and stuff I just didn't yeah. really I think I tried it once for a gray coverage and it, I just got nothing so I never tried yeah. it again yeah it's, um, it, is, it is a lot softer it's not really I wouldn't go in with H nectar and promise to your client you're going to get full gray coverage at all. yeah no she was super resistant but also yeah. it's super sensitive so we yeah gave it a whirl but I didn't have much did I didn't have any education on it did you use just straight base I think so yeah yeah okay did yeah. you get any coverage at all um it was a little while ago I think it was pretty minimal yeah. <laughs> so that memory. was when you would you think okay well, I've, I've got to go in with like a whole shade darker but we're still yeah. not going to guarantee you full coverage like my client no. that I did it on had really really fine hair so yeah. obviously her saturation points a lot less or greater and she um and it wasn't really super glassy and resistant so she's an ideal candidate for um gray hair coverage or blendage yeah. with h nectar I would always use H color for that, um, yeah. for, for your total coverage. And, you know, I know a lot of salons use H nectar to tone and it's beautiful because it's a rebuilding color, but I also, I use H color pretty much predominantly and yeah. have my H nectar as my go-tos for those particular reasons as well um, yeah. with, with the client. Yeah. But cool. But obviously I, I, I was a Veda for 14 years. I used to work for them in the UK. So I know exactly what it's like when you change from a brand where you have a base and you add tone to something yeah. the color chart and go, well, how do I get two grams of blue violet and three grams of yellow? So maybe Phoebe, we can connect um, and have a bit of a chat with you because I can give you some really good ideas of, to make it easier for you to, to convert over. Perfect. Thank we'll you. And we'll do a Zoom there. So I'll, I'll flick you an email later. Thank um, you. It's all right. Did anyone else have any questions on, on anything? Maybe just to, um, off the back of that question, do yep. you think it, with your particular case using the 634 that you would have got better coverage with using a warm shade to sort of like fill the grey? Wanting If you were using just a 6.0 or just a 7.0 or even some ash, um, my assumption would be that you might not get as better coverage, but with a warm shade, because you've got that um, sort of filling component, even though it is for grey coverage, that you might have got better coverage because of that. Yeah. Um, is that with the H nectar you're talking about? Yeah, yeah. Sorry. yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah I had that, the same yeah. Struggle with um, coverage or getting like a bit of a, if I'm just using base, like getting a bit of a murkier kind of result, like maybe yeah. gold results would come up better. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, so in in that case too, like um, like I said, it, it is also case sensitive with your clients. Even though we have warm bases, um, and I've swatch tested all our bases against competitors on white synthetic hair, and our bases are are warm. Um, sometimes with great coverage, like like Jenna said, adding a little bit of gold pigment definitely helps. It's almost like it undercoats it for that as well. Um, so. 
if you've ever done an O1 or you're using ash and you think, oh, you know, you can still add a little bit of gold or put a little bit of 3-1 into your mix as well because you've got that gold and ash tone to help you get a bit of coverage. Um, and that's going to be trial and error. But, yeah, straight using the, the point O's. I don't know. I think um, my, my end result was definitely a 3-4. Like there was no flatness from any base whatsoever. But, yeah, yeah, you're right, maybe doing that as well. But I was just with, working with a girl in our salons up here and she has a client that is super sensitive and obviously we don't have black in H Nectar, so the darkest you can go is 3.0. And I said to her, uh, don't mix any tone in it, just use straight 3.0. Um, and it worked beautifully. So I think um, maybe it was because it is case different. And Phoebe's client, she had really coarse resistant hair. Um, so from a consultation point of view, um, I wouldn't have gone in with H Nectar. But from a sensitivity point of view, that's what you want to use because she's hypersensitive. Um, if you worry, yeah, it's patch test with, with H Colour. But I haven't had, obviously, you, some of you guys have been using the colour a way a lot longer than what I have. And I haven't had the amount of clients go through my chair to see um, percentage wise with reactions. But um, Jenna, you probably, have you had seen many clients with reactions to H colour at all in the H salon? Or H nectar? H colour. Um, I guess because of our philosophy sometimes, but um, yeah, I wouldn't say definitely not compared to any other range. No. Um, but obviously yeah. we just gain a lot of clients um, because you get, of you get clients come to you. Uh, yeah, they, yeah. Uh, we have everybody who's allergic to everything. Um, yeah. I mean, I've even had clients that I've applied tints a millimeter off the scalp to suit them sometimes because they're, it's not necessarily, it's not a reaction to the product. Um, so to answer your question, probably not. Um, but like, there's just so many ways that you can avoid um, these days by highlighting, by, I yeah. don't know, balayaging, foiling, applying off yeah. the scalp. Um, creatively there's so many differences now yeah. Um, but yeah not we like I haven't really unless we if I want great coverage I wouldn't really go H nectar I'd probably explore other options um, if they were resistant then absolutely yeah I would be foiling yeah. and having a I don't know yeah some kind of natural result and talking them down that road instead of trying to go for coverage that they might not necessarily get with with any range as well like yeah, some people have those clients that are just tough <laughs> yeah oh yeah i mean i've traditionally before i turned to more of a natural option <clears throat> um we didn't have all these products around when i trained um so the products i used they you'd mix them in the bowl and they'd burn your face like they just hit you with like um, ammonia and fumes and you put it on the scalp and the client's like oh i can feel it we would give them a clip or a tail comb to scratch their scalp while the color was processing. We did all the worst things that you could possibly do, but we knew no better. We had clients smoking cigarettes in the salon. We would offer them a coffee and an ashtray. That's what we used to do. You know, it's crazy. Um, now it's like you know, um, we're we're embracing the the healthy side of our industry um, and removing as many chemicals chemicals as we can. But we still have to achieve results because without the results, you're not going to get the clients back. Um, so yeah, so I think if you if you want to go over to H Nectar, we just probably have to under deliver and overachieve with what we promised them. Um, always do a patch test with H Nectar, uh, H Color if they're super super sensitive. But um, and then you've got your H Screen as well that you can add directly into your tints as well. So mix up your color and add four or five pumps of H Screen directly into your bowl. Mix that in, and that also creates a beautiful barrier to, to help reduce irritation while the color's processing. It's great for clients with psoriasis, um, anyone with eczema, or people that might come to you, as like Jenna said, you know, clients um, are actually outsourcing salons that can offer these sorts of things. So if you get a client come to you, they're going to tell you, I'm hypersensitive, I'm allergic to everything. You know, they'll sit in your chair and scream it at you, um, basically talking themselves into being sensitive sometimes. But if that's the case, H screen everything. Put four to five pumps of H screen in your tins. Um, and just help that. Lynn, yes? um, if you add H screen into the mix, will it weaken the color? No, not at all. So H screen predominantly has been designed as a, as a skin protector, skin barrier. So you can put H screen directly around the hairline and it's okay to touch the hair. Whereas traditionally um, we used to use barrier creams and things like that. And you couldn't actually 
um, make sure that barrier cream is touching the hair because it would stop the color from getting in. With H nectar, uh, sorry, H screen, you can pretty much, they can put it right on the hair as well as the skin. So you, it stops the stain, stainage, but it goes through and colors the hair. So that's an indication of it's not really going to stop the color from getting in. Um, if anything, also H screen, 100% oil, beautiful, makes the hair beautiful and shiny. So if you're running a color through the ends, pop a bit of H screen in it, mix it in, and you can color balance with it too. It's really nice. Yeah. Cool. Um, Eve, did you have a question you asked because your microphone went off and I didn't? Did you want to ask? Yeah, I do. Sorry. Yeah. Um, I've had a few issues with a client that she's basically. 75% grey, but she's got the, the dark bits in her hair. Yeah. You know how they're like salt and pepper. Yeah. Um, whenever I used 6% on her, she'd always throw warmth. So now I've been using 9 volt to like, tra like get a translucent bit coverage on her and it's working a lot better, but I've had to go to foils now because you're still throwing red in like the dark bits. So what's her natural base? Great. Like like, no, no, her dark bits. What are they? Her natural. Oh, like a five. Yep. And what color are you putting on? Like a six or seven? No, I've tried all the 90 series because she wants to be actually gray. And then I've tried like the nine one and then I've gone to eight one and then now I've gone to seven one. Okay. So obviously what's happening is like your base um, five Obviously, mm -hmm. because you've been you've been um, using twenty volt for coverage, but you're also lifting from the yeah. five up, so that's where your warmth's coming from, um, and then like a true ash. So that's that sort of client that you're never going to get the lift and coverage in one guy. Yeah, um, you can compromise and meet in the middle, but that's the sort of client that I would do. Whereas I would do um, put in my seven and seven point one for my coverage, um, use my twenty volt, but you're going to have to do foils as well and mm. like cream them out and then put a, like a really beautiful soft toner over the whole lot. So I have a lot of clients that have had gray hair and they're a darker base and using like eight and seven or even 8.1 and 20 vol is going to give you coverage, but obviously it's lifting that natural hair up and that's where your warmth is coming from. Mm. Um, but that's, um, and then, then I would have to go through and do floodlights or foils as well to compensate from the warmth to give them that kind of, um, blonde who's the girl oh, i can never remember her name which is one of my she was used to date brad pitt years and years and years ago what was her name gwyneth paltrow oh, you yeah. know that kind of gwyneth paltrow sandy she's not a she's not a white blonde she's like a sandy cream with at with creamy bits going through it she's not ash either i love that color that's like a, an ash tint and foil combination and that's the best way to, to counteract this you're never going to get it in one go it's always going to be a bit of coverage and then she's going to have basically orange in her hair because it's coming up from the five. Yeah. Yeah. So okay. that's a, yeah. that's a, a two color. So in a lot of, um, you know, with, or with our price list in the salon I used to own, we would have, you know, obviously all your foil prices, we would have your tint prices. Then I would have a creative color price. And that was all, always 30 to $50 dearer, whether it was on short or long hair. And that creative color encompassed a tint regrowth and foils because yeah. you needed to do both to get there. And that was one of the clients, uh, typically a, a, a client that would fall into that category of a creative colour because you're doubling up on your work to try to get that end result. And then the, the greyer she gets and then the less base she's got in it, the less foils you end up having to need to do. So, the, you know, we always to say to them, it's great because as, as you get older and you get greyer, we don't have to do as many foils, so the colour will, will get easier. But unfortunately, it's not a one-trick pony. That's almost, it's not a double process. I used to always put my tint on and then I'd do my foils over the top, whereas a lot of people don't do that, but we call it floodlights. We did it all the time. Been doing it for years and it works amazing because you get coverage of the grey and then the then the uh, H bleach will then lighten the tint up. So therefore, your colour's even. Whereas if you go in and do your foils first and tint around it, your H bleach doesn't cover the grey and you're also lightening natural hair and you've got artificial pigment on the end. So it's you're going to get an uneven result. So oh. we would always floodlight that client, which was tint regrowth, then 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 our um, powder or cream lightener to, to give us our lift as well. Okay. Yeah, so you can try that. Yeah, I, last time I've done, um, I've done all baby lights in her hair. So I did like the H bleach with 6% and then I've done... 
I think it was seven one and nine vol, and she was like, "This is amazing." Oh, okay. So I picked up it all where like the <clears throat> the dark bits were. Yeah. Um, I've done that with like the seven one foil. Yeah. And it was like it was really even. Yeah, cool. So so by doing that combination <laughs> of color, you've got around it. Um, also too, like I mix my vols together. So if you don't want, I mean, twenty vol will give you up to two levels lift depending on whether the hair's fine or thick, okay? So we say one to two levels. That means you're not always gonna get two levels on thick, coarse hair. On finer hair, you'll get it. 30 volts, two to three, and 40 volts, three to four. Most brands will say that with their developers, but sometimes you wanna, uh, you wanna kick a bit of base, you wanna kick a bit of the, the, the product, but you don't wanna use all 20 volts. So you could mix um, H-Tone and um, 20 volt together and make a 15 volt. That's going to give you a little bit more coverage, but also help reduce that lift that you're going to get as well when you're doing that color. Yeah. Okay. Cause yeah. I've been, I don't know. I've, I'm obviously naughty cause I only use nine volt for my gray coverage. I don't even use 6%. Okay, that's not naughty. That's just you knowing what works on your clients and breaking your rules. But <laughs> um, I've got some clients that if I've used nine vol, I just know it's not going to work. And I've yeah. done tests where I've used thirty vol, and I've got beautiful full coverage. So dropping everything a shade darker, where you would normally use half six and half six three four, use half five and half five three four, and use thirty vol, um, and that will give you a level six result because the 30 volt lifts you up, but it's stronger and it opens that gray cuticle as well. I don't teach that, but I have done it on one on the same person from visit to visit um, who was a model and it worked really well as well. So there are different ways that you're going to get it, but it's um, case specific too, like I said. But if you're getting really good results with nine volt, that's, that's great, really great. Yeah, I use the hyper color and all my like gray coverages and all my toners. And all the H screen, I put them in everything as well. So, okay. so the hyper color is probably assisting you with that as well. And you're using one to one mix. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. So you're saturating it, helping draw the pigment in. Um, so that's great. Maybe that's yeah. something you know. If we've got clients out there, if you're going to do it with nine bowl on a client in, in the salon and you're, and you're just trying it, I would do it on someone with finer hair to start with, um, just so you to make sure that it actually does saturate um, the pigment as well. I didn't know you could use that in the bleach though. Beg your pardon? I didn't know that you could use the hypercolor drops in the bleach though. No, we weren't talking about, I wasn't talking about using it in the bleach. I was talking oh. about more if you're doing like kind of low lights and things like that, you can use it in your foils. Oh, okay. Yeah, sorry. Um, hypercolor is oh, okay. not really going to do much for bleach because it's two different reactions. One's trying to draw a pigment in, which mm, isn't bleach. That's what I thought. Bleach is trying to lift it out. So yeah, don't use hypercolor with bleach. Hypercolor in foils is if you've got a client like Jenna was talking about and you're and she's doesn't have the color on a scalp, but you're doing foils for coverage, you can put mm -hmm. hypercolor in that, but not in not in oh yeah, in the tint. Yep, yeah, yeah, in yeah. The tint. Yeah, yeah. Cool. But you can put H screen in the bleach, can't you? Yeah, hundred yeah. percent. So yeah. on scalp bleaching, it's awesome for that. Um, because of our products are softer. Um, and H bleach, obviously, we know it's full of butters and conditioning agents, and so is our catalyst. By putting, um, sometimes I lift my bowl up when I'm using H bleach as well, depending on what hair you're going over. So application is important. But if you're doing H bleach and 30 vol on scalp, you put H screen in it as well as a protector. But I found that's been amazing as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah I use all that. Yeah, cool. Oh, Lovely. Yeah. Did anyone else have any questions they want to cover or? No, all good. Cool. You've been great. Thank you. Lovely. So um, this is recorded, uh, like I said before. So um, if there's anyone out there that has staff members or you've got a new staff member that wants to start and, and you, they're going over great coverage and you want a copy of this, just um, give me an email and I can flick it to you as well because um, it might be good to have in your bank to use as some training as well. Um, otherwise, uh, I know a few of you are, look, are Zooming on for next week. Um, as well, which we, we're doing Olaplex versus H Milk and doing our comparisons with that. That um, I enjoyed researching that and working out, you know, what exactly is H Milk and how it works versus Olaplex in salons and why Olaplex slows things down, why our processing takes a little bit longer to come up as well. And I found it really interesting. So I've broken all that down for you as well. Um, so if you're on that one, I'll see you then. If not, um, I may see you on a Zoom session if you want want to chat to me. Otherwise, when you know I can fly, I'll come visit you all, which I can't wait. 
I can't wait to, you know, get to Melbourne actually, you know, and see, I used to live in Melbourne. I love it. But to meet everybody, I want to get down there too. Cool. And New Zealand, Abby. <laughs> cool. Lovely. All right. I'm just going to stop the recording.